the whole periodization logic is it has been a quest for finding the best training plan. So there's this perception that comes from that, that there is such a thing as a best. Uh, and for me, clearly there isn't. There's the what's the best right now for this particular person. That triathlon show, 148. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview John Keeley, who is a researcher at the University of Central Lancashire and also a coach and consultant. The topic of our discussion is periodization and how it's not the holy grail that it's uh, sometimes made out to be. John points out a lot of the flaws that have led to periodization becoming almost dogmatic and discusses why it doesn't work like that in the real world and that there actually is very little evidence supporting periodization in the way it's uh, typically prescribed. And also, of course, we get into what this means for athletes like you and, and me in practice. This is uh, not just a science podcast episode by no means, John does a lot of practical work in the trenches. He has worked directly with the coaches of uh, Olympic and world champions in three major sports. He has coached a Paralympic track medalist and European champion, numerous combat sport athletes and, uh, and a lot of kids as well. He does a lot of coaching in that realm. And from a team sports perspective, he has worked as a consultant for uh, rugby teams and uh, he's the director of fitness for the Gary Owen Rugby Academy and he has been an advisor to some top professional football clubs. But before we dive into the interview, let's thank our sponsors. First, we have Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. If you suffer from cramping in training or racing, or just uh, unreasonably large performance decrements in the heat or things like nausea, it is very likely that one of the major reasons is that you're not replenishing your electrolytes correctly. So, And this is an area where you can't just take blind guesses at how much you need. It won't work because you need to personalize your consumption of electrolytes to your sweat rate and your sweat sodium content. And that's the reason that Andy Blow, uh, who is the founder of Precision Hydration, founded the company in the first place. Listen to my interview with Andy in episode 49. That was the first time he was on and, and talked about electrolytes and cramping and, and those sorts of things. But anyway, Precision Hydration makes it super easy for you to create and execute a precise individualized hydration plan. Uh, one, you take the free online sweat test that is linked to in the show notes and episode description. And uh, that is free. It takes a few minutes. It's a simple quiz with like 10 questions or so. Uh, two, you get the electrolyte products that match your needs based on that quiz. And three, you follow the plan that you will be sent to, uh, to your email directly after you complete that online sweat test. So it is very easy. And again, that's precisionhydration.com. And if you've never used their products before, you can get your first box for free with the promo code that triathlon show all one word all caps and this episode is also sponsored by roca you don't need to do much else than look at the list of triathletes that are using roca equipment to understand that uh, this is uh, the best triathlon apparel brand in the world because the best athletes are using it we have mario mola flora duffy the top two uh, the top male and top female on the itu circuit we have lucy charles gwen jorgensen javier gomez and many 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 other of the top names in triathlon are using roca i would make an educated guess that uh, their roster is uh, more impressive much more impressive than any other triathlon apparel manufacturer out there although i haven't compiled lists from the others so uh, who knows somebody can maybe do that and then we can get that verified 
Anyway, Roka has tri suits, wetsuits, buoyancy shorts, swim skins, sunglasses, goggles, all sorts of apparel that you need. And when you want the best of the best, you should go to roka.com and order that. And the, what's even better is that you can get 20% off your entire order when you use the promo code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps. And again, that URL is roka.com, and I'll link to it in the episode description. All right, so without any further ado, let's dive right into the interview with uh, John Keeley. So welcome to That Triathlon Show, John Keeley. How are you today? Uh, Very good, Mikhail. Nice to meet you. It's great to have you, and this is uh, the second or third attempt at this interview, so we have all the redundancies in place now. Let's just hope that uh, that this time we're third times the charm and that uh, we get all the audio from today as opposed to previous attempts. But uh, let's let's start and talk about periodization. And uh, the first thing that I want to ask you is how much has periodization been studied systematically uh, in the literature and, and what do those studies and published results show? Well, I guess uh, surprisingly for a concept that is such a mainstay of our conventional perspectives on training, it hasn't been studied extensively. There has been quite a few studies within the strength training realm, but once you get away from strength training, then there's very little there's very little work done. Um, now, strength training obviously lends itself well to academic study. Uh, loads, reps, things like that are very easily quantified. But even in the the strength training literature uh, on periodization, if you review all the literature, what you see is most of the time, if somebody has a structured training program, they perform marginally better than if they don't have a structured training program. Now, with structure, with structure, do you what? How do you define that in in this context? Does that mean periodized, or or what I'm getting at is? If you have a non-structured program, does that mean that you're just doing randomly random things? You're going to the gym and just starting lifting weights and choosing whatever reps you prefer on the day and whatever exercises? Or what is non-structured versus structured in this context? Well, that's a really good question. And more, again, most of these training designs are very simple. It's, uh, for an example, that you might have one group, the experimental group, would have a little more variation in their training. And their their variation will be organized in a structured way. So we'll do day one like this and day two like this every week. Or after two weeks, we will change from X regime to Y regime. So that's what I mean by structure, that there's um, there's a little bit of organization to it against an... uh, uh, a control group that either doesn't have any variation uh, or has less structured variation. Now, okay. So, so what you get is if if you look at all the studies that have been done, and some show no difference, uh, but the majority will show a small increase in training gains in strength training uh, with structure rather than either no variation or very random variation. So so that's the basic finding. And I think the best resource, if people are interested in delving deeper into this, there's a, a researcher called Greg Knuckles, N-U-C-K-O-L-S in the States, who's written a very, very good blog post, What the Data Say?, and that's well worth the read. It will go into this in a lot more detail than, than we'll have time to. But essentially what you see there is in an aspect of training like strength training, which can be very easily controlled, uh, that structured variation seems to work better than no variation or random variation, but that benefit is small. And, and that's pretty much what all, if you lump all that data together, that's the message. Now, that has been 
translated to mean, oh, well, periodization works. But periodized programs tend to be a lot more complex and a lot more detailed. And they're obviously multiphasic in terms of it's not just over one phase, it's over a series of phases. And the, the research in multiphasic uh, training programs is pretty much non-existent. There are a few, but in such a complex area, a few isolated studies tell us very, very little. So if I was to sum it all up very briefly, I would say that organization, some logical organization to, of training seems to help. But we have no idea what the best way of organizing that training is. And it would be, it is an incredibly difficult question to answer with the very blunt tool of conventional experimental designs. So that's a great overview. And uh, the follow up question, then, as you alluded to already, it's periodization is almost taken for granted that this is something that we have to do. It's an essential part of the strength training puzzle of the endurance sports puzzle whatever sports you're talking about really where does that uh, perception of periodization come from we we've heard about all these uh, uh, researchers in the old soviet union that came up with with these concepts and that's perhaps where he was born you might correct me if there is some unknown uh, origin before that but uh, why do you think this has taken hold, this picture of periodization being an essential component of uh, of any sort of training program? Well, I, I guess the first thing to say here is that um, when we're talking about periodization, there's a specific meaning to that, or at least historically there was. So periodization was an idea that came from the Soviet Union, as you say, and it was an idea of a very reg regimented design. So first you do X, then you do Y, then you do Z. Uh, the length of your training phases is, and again, depending on the theorist, it was three weeks or four weeks or five weeks. Uh, so it, it was not just, there's a difference between a periodized program and a planned program in that there's a, there's a few more guidelines in a periodized program. This is what we do. We do it for X amount of time. Once we're finished that, then we do this. And it is very much uh, a pre-planned, pre-organized, what I would think of as, at least historically, non-reactive uh, way of organizing your training. So that's quite different from a, planning, a, a training program that is structured but is not organized around preconceived uh, best practice. So, for example, the, the classic illustration is if I want to develop my power, first I have to do strength training using X amount of uh, repetitions and X percentage of max weight. If I want to do power training, then after the strength training, I then do a block of power training and I change the amount of reps and the amount of weight. And it's very much a, a mathematical process. You can, uh, and, you know, you can see this clearly in a lot of the, the strength and conditioning texts. It's first we do this, this percentage, this many times for this many sets. And then at four weeks or six weeks, there's a change. And now we're doing power. And that's just, this is something different. So, if that makes sense, and hopefully I've been clear on that, but there's a difference between a coach planning a training program and a coach planning a training program based on periodized principles. If you were to drill down to the key differences, I think periodization templates do what they say in the team. They offer you a template how to plan a long-term training program over the course of a season, uh, over the course of an Olympic quadrennial, uh, whereas a more, what I would think of as historically, there's a lot of coaches who are very intuitive, uh, who would set a structure to their training, 
but would alternate that structure based on emerging information, where that emerging information can be observation of the athlete, athlete feedback. Uh, it could be based on, on any form of information, collection, analysis, and then a change of direction. Now, these might sound like subtle differences, but, and, and this is getting back to your question, we were all brought up on this ideal of periodization is best. But, and we all pretty much accepted that because it was in the, it was in the atmosphere. It was a resounding message from everyone. This is the way to do it. This is the way the Soviets do it. This is the way coach X did it. This is the way a great coach Y did it. So this is the best way. And we were all brought up with that kind of, there is a best way. Then the individual periodization theorists, they argued back and forth, well, you know, it's my way is actually the best way, not the other, that, that theorist's way, or, you know, it, it's my way for this reason. And if you look at the periodization literature, there's been quite a bit of that, you know, uh, Matviev obviously was the most famous, and I guess the one that brought periodization to uh, our kind of Western consciousness he dies, Verkoshansky says, well, Matviev, that wasn't right. Here's my way. Verkoshansky dies, Vladimir Surin comes in. Well, no, you know, he was wrong. This is my way. Uh, so what we kind of ended up was this very much, at least to my way of thinking, a very belief-based system. Uh it's best to periodize. It's best because of all these reasons that are very, very cloudy. And if you try and dig into the science of well, why is this periodized way the best, you find that the scientific rationale is extremely is on extremely uh, not solid ground. Yeah, that- it is. Sorry, go on. Yeah, so so I just want to to jump in here and say that, and I think from from my perspective, it's very clear what you mean here with a structured program versus a, a periodized program. In in that, but just to make it clear for the listeners, in in case it wasn't uh, with the periodized uh, plan, the idea is that you decide beforehand that okay, I'm going to do base endurance for for two two months, and then I'm going to move to some sort of more strength or stamina based training for for two more months and then i go into move into the high end high end intervals like high zone four zone five vo2 max type intervals that's a classic traditional periodization model for example and and regardless of how you're developing it's uh, you're you're going to follow that pattern whereas a programmed uh program plan a structured plan might start like that it might start the same a coach might tell you to okay we're going to do for the next block of training we're going to do this base endurance and uh, but then they they might see that okay actually now you really stopped responding to that and then they might introduce that other stimulus a bit earlier than initially planned and then perhaps what happens is that you get sick or something so you go back to your previous phase or and all these things that life might throw in your way and your training progress might throw in your way they should be taken into account and you still have the structure but but it's not following that that path that's clearly laid out from point a to point b that's way ahead in the future you take a lot of different inputs into account basically when you when you keep following a sort of structured training program but but it's not the path is not so clearly laid out and it's definitely not set, fixed at least even if there is a path that might lead you to your goal so what does that explain it what what you mean john uh yes i think it largely does i guess there's a couple of other perhaps deeper implications of it that have been embedded in our consciousness, in our, in our cultural coaching consciousness. And that is that the whole periodiz- periodization logic is, it has been a quest for finding the best training plan. So there's this perception that comes from that, that there is such a thing as a best. Uh, and for me, clearly there isn't. There's the what's, the best right now for this particular person. Uh, 
The other issue with periodization is that it is, it's very much a mechanical procedure. If you work at this intensity for this long, this many times, this, at, at this frequency, you will get this. So there's an assumption that there's a predictability about training outcomes. And in contrast to periodization, where this actual hard evidence is extremely fluffy, if we look at the response of individuals to training, so not group-based average responses, but the response of individuals to training, it's extremely broad and ext- and very unpredictable. Uh, and there's, there's been a number of classic studies on this where uh, you give people a, a standardized endurance training program and you get people who make massive improvements in a simple measure like VO2 max versus people who go slightly backwards. Exact same thing in, in strength training. Uh, and this, now th- these are normally untrained people, but you do. John, John, I lost you there for a few seconds. So can you go back? You, some people can make massive improvements on that plan and uh, some others go backwards. And then I lost you for a few seconds. So can you repeat from, from there, please? So what we see when we, and obviously the convention in training studies is to introduce some training intervention, then average out all the improvements and then make a judgment on whether or not that type of training was efficient or productive or not. But when you actually drill down into the individual data, what you see is that the range of training responses to any given intervention is really wide now so that's one thing that periodization theoretically doesn't really factor in it's it's an assumption that there is a best way that there is a best uh training prescription there is a best organization of training so that's a big assumption that isn't supported by current science the the next thing, and may, maybe this is a more insidious influence of periodization, but does the implicit belief in periodization that how much you improve is totally dependent on the work that you do? And I would suggest that that's not the case. Now, what I mean by that is, uh, if there was, if it was me and my genetically engineered twin brother with the exact same histories, and we both do the exact same training session, and my genetically engineered twin is in a different nutritional state than I am, then we'll have different adaptations. One might not respond, and one will respond. So that's an obvious one. If one is fatigued and the other isn't, we'll respond differently. But I think what's really clear the past 10, 15 years is that your psycho-emotional state, so basically what type of mood you're in, how you, you your interpretation of how relevant this activity is to you and your aims and who you are, all of those things impact on your individual response to the training that you do. Yet, if we look at the periodization literature, it gives us the the impression that the only thing that matters is the training that you do. Now, it's perhaps unfair to lay all that blame on periodization theory, but because that has been our approach, certainly in science, I think throughout history there have been intuitive uh extremely clever, experienced coaches who understand that if I want to get the best out of this athlete, I need to put them in the right place emotionally, psychologically. Uh, I need to engage them. I need to motivate them. There's a whole range of things that are non-physical that go into the optimal conditioning program for this athlete. And I guess my argument there is that if all of these things are so important, how come we never talked about them in our training literature? How can there be such a big disconnect? Uh, 
And again, it's pretty much an academic disconnect in the terms of it's the periodization literature that has been published has completely neglected this. Now, you asked a while ago about historical roots. Can, can, I, can I jump in here? Can I, can I jump in here with one sure. question? Uh, you say completely neglected. Does that mean that there's not a single study that has investigated any sort of uh, factor, like you mentioned the psycho-emotional state or the nutritional state or other factors that uh, that have an impact on how you adapt to training? Or is there some, but just very limited? But if there is some, could you give some example of what has been found in the literature? Great. Thanks for that, because that, that's useful. Um, in terms of training, there has there, there, there is now some studies. Uh, there's a bit more around injury, uh, athletic injury. And again, what you see is, uh, and if I use the word stress, uh, I, I presume people understand what I mean. I'm talking about psycho-emotional stress, uh, be it relationships or disagreement with coach or competitive pressure or worried about injury but but you know that type of psycho-emotional stress uh in the past few years there's been a growing number of studies that shown one that if you are a person an individual that is predisposed to stress and you are under stress that you will be more likely to get injured when you get injured you will be slower to rehabilitate uh, and that's either from injury or you will be more inclined to uh, have a, a, an illness. And again, this is just an offshoot of a much wider literature on the effects of psycho-emotional stress uh, in, in wider society that shows it is clearly, clearly implicated with disease factors, lifelong health, life expectancy, no matter what way you want to slice our health, it is fundamentally uh, influenced by what we think, how we think, our history in in terms of our history of stress, uh, and how stress resilient or, or vulnerable to stress we are. And again, this isn't necessarily an argument purely against periodization. This is an argument about hey, you know what? In our training theory, in our coaching theory historically, we haven't really bought into that, bar some shining examples of some some excellent coaches. But we haven't really bought into that. And I think it needs to be factored in and it needs to be built into not only how we deal with athletes, but also how we plan training, how we communicate the plan to the athlete. Um, I say that because I think there, there's a very rational argument there to suggest that the athlete, the, the, there's no such thing as the best plan as written on paper. But if there's a plan that the athlete understands and it is well thought through and the athlete believes in that plan and the athlete buys into the plan and the athlete has faith in the coach and the athlete has a high expectancy of that plan. In other words, the athlete expects good results from that plan, that all of those things are essential ingredients for the optimal plan. The optimal plan is not something that the coach sits on their own and constructs on an Excel sheet. And anything that gives up and coming coaches that message is fundamentally taking a, a, a keyhole view of this big wide vista of multiple factors that influence every aspect of athlete development. Uh, and I guess if I was to pinpoint what my key criticism of conventional training program design is, it's always tends to be it's just the mechanical stressors that we focus on. We never focus on, OK, where in the training plan do I communicate the why of the training plan to the athlete? Where do I allow the athlete to feed back into the plan? A couple of, uh, of points still to discuss. Uh, one of them that we already mentioned, but I want to go a little bit deeper into is stress. Uh, how does that impact uh, the the benefit of or, or lack of benefit of periodization models? What, what is the role of stress in this discussion, really? Uh, well, I think, well, first of all, defining stress is 
it's actually quite difficult. <laughs> um, but let's just, for the purposes of our conversation, talk about stress as any stimulus that changes chemistry in your brain. Now, that's a really simple definition, but it's it's pretty accurate. So if I get a stress, be it positive or negative, it's a change in my perception of the outside world that induces a subtle change in the neurochemistry of my brain. Now, what that subtle change in, in chemistry does is it drives downstream chemical changes. So uh, it changes maybe the uh, circulation of the amount of circulating hormones in my body. It changes all these inflammatory agents. Basically, it changes everything. So at, as it, at its very most fundamental uh as far down as you can break it, what is stress? Stress is something that causes the chemistry, the, the chemical concentrations in your brain to change. Okay, so that's what we do when we train all the time. Uh, that's what we do when we get up in the morning. We have all these rhythms in our brain that are set up to prepare us for the forecasted challenges of that day. Now, where things go go wrong is when we are stressed for prolonged periods. We are stressed about, am I going to get let go from my job, for example? So you have a stress response that evolved to handle a short-term problem that switched on for prolonged periods. Uh, and that has numerous negative effects. Uh, if you want to die young, if you want to be at risk of disability and disease factors, be a highly stressed person, be a very stress reactive person. Uh, and I mean, the evidence for that is, is everywhere in the medical literature. From a training perspective, what does stress do? Well, if you have too much of it, then you, you will get injured more. You will get ill more. You will take longer to recover. Uh, you will get your adaptation for training will be blunted. Now, that sounds like a very non-conventional message, but if you think about it, really all it's saying is if me and my genetically engineered twin brother go training and we're both in different psychoemotional states, so he's feeling happy, calm, looking forward to the session, I've had a bad day at work. I'm fighting with my partner. I was up all night with the kid. I'm in a completely different chemical. Uh, I have a completely different neurochemical environment. Hence, I have a completely different biological environment. Hence, the backdrop that we're, the foundation, the chemical foundation upon which we're overlaying the training stimulus is completely different. Therefore, the adaptation will be different. No. And, and in your in your papers, you you argue, which uh, makes complete sense and is uh, not difficult to understand now that you've laid all of this out for us, that this is one of the main reasons that the periodization theories of old they they don't really work in practice, and and I guess especially so when we're talking about people that are not elite athletes that are brought up in uh, in on the soviet training camp where, where basically everything can be taken care of for them and they only have to focus on eating sleeping and training uh is uh is that uh r- roughly what what you what you are saying in in those papers as it pertains to stress well uh yes and no so let me clarify and it's my fault i haven't made it clear periodization i think uh, and again you know, we could get into definitions. It depends how you define periodization and how strict you take it. But my interest is in how can we be better at organizing and planning and managing training? So ultimately, if I'm working with a, you know, a club or an international team, I, I don't care if they call it periodization or planning. Uh, and in a sense, I don't really even care how training is organized. It's how is it how is it implemented? How is it managed? How is information collected? Information, not just data, not just GPS data or, uh, or mechanical stats, but how is feedback from the players collected? And then how is that all, all that information 
put together and used to inform what you're going to do next. Uh, I think in terms of periodization, it's it's quite easy these days to to knock traditional periodization because it's clear that we all respond in in very different ways. There's such a broad diversity of responses to any given training in intervention that now with this stage, it's ridiculous to think that there is a, a best way. There isn't a best way. There's a best way for you now. That's all. Um, now, the second point about stress is a lot of periodization logic was built on archaic stress theory from the 1930s. People will have heard of Hanselli and so on. Again, stress theory has evolved dramatically. And I guess the big change from Selye's day, and, and, and Selye, kind of late in his life, not long before he died, said that for him, stress was a, a medical and physiological uh, condition. Whereas he thought of psychological stress as something different. It's really clear since I would say the late sixties, mid seventies, that, you know, stress is kind of this bi-directional phenomenon. Physical stress can affect your mental state and vice versa. Your mental state affects your physical state. We've just been really slow to absorb that within our, you know, coaching culture and our coaching science culture. Now, so there's two separate things. Old periodization, okay, let's put that to the side. Uh, the role of stress in influencing your training mm, and how should that affect training design, that's something that we haven't really come to terms with. I think what I would suggest is a couple of things. First of all, athletes need some degree of organization. It's pointless uh, and, and I, I don't see how it would work if athletes came and just did what they wanted on, on a given day. So uh, there needs to be some organization, but I think we should park the idea that there's a best way of doing that. And it's, you know, volume first or intensity first, or it's reverse periodization or it's conjugate sequence periodization. To me, they're all just unsupported theories. For, for a coach, I think it's about looking at the athlete, looking at their training history, their sense of what this athlete adapts to, what they need, and just constructing a logical, sensible starting point. So, so, your start, sorry, go on. Yeah, so, so we're now transitioning into the, the final topic that we said that we would discuss, which is really the process of planning your training, whether it's your coach that plans your training for you or the athlete that is self-coached, just to, to uh, I guess, bring some context to this discussion that we're, we're in right now. And now we're focusing really on the, on, on the process of how you can structure your training, have organization to it, but uh, make it basically based on based on the, the the terms that you as an athlete require so so go on with what you were saying yeah so i guess what i'm saying is we need there's there's a number of trade offs there's variation versus monotony so how much variation do i need there's no formula there's no theory that will tell you that what we do know is variation helps what we know certainly in endurance sports is you know, there's been no highly elite endurance athletes that haven't spent a lot of time in their specific movement pattern at low intensities. Uh, and I think, I know we've previously mentioned the research of Stephen Sellier in, in, in Norway. And I think that if anyone hasn't come across that, they should read some of his papers on uh, elite endurance athletes and their training histories. Episode 120 is a, a good review about his his work. Very good. Very good. But if I was just to give the kind of the shorthand there, it would lots of low intensity stuff and judicious, judicious use of high intensity work. Uh, but no indication of how you should organize that. You need to clock it up. You need to get the miles in the tank. But I don't think we know how you get them. I mean, if there's a specific way. Or sorry, a, a specific best pattern. My suggestion is that there isn't, but it's about being sensible rather than 
in a sense, being theory driven. So I accumulate gradually. It's gradual progressive overload. Change is good, but sudden change is bad. Sudden change is the biggest risk factor of injury and illness. So I need to manage change all the time. What I'm suggesting as a layer on top of just good logical training management is that there's, there are all these stress-related and emotional factors that the coach has a significant influence on that in turn significantly influence actual fitness adaptations. So, for example, the relationship between the coach and the athlete will influence how well the athlete responds to training. Whether If the athlete goes and does a training session and they, they don't know why they're doing it, they don't have a sense of purpose, they don't understand how this can lead to their long-term goals, there is a, a lack of commitment of, of, of deep contact w- 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 with the session. Again, for me, that will, uh, that will mitigate the positive training responses. Uh, th- that the athlete has a sense of, of, of buy-in and purpose and deep commitment to the training session. Uh, and this can be something that coaches can implement really easily by just giving some time to the athlete, having periods or identified junctures in the training program where, you know, they will meet and discuss how are you feeling about this training program? Uh, is it benefiting you, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that shows the athlete that I, as the coach, as the person who sets your plan, I'm committed to you. I care what you think. This program is for you. Uh, You have part ownership of this program. Anything like that. I think the evidence, although we haven't really uh, bought into it in in, in our world, in the coaching world, I think the evidence is clear that all of that will significantly influence uh, or yeah will increase positive outcomes and alternatively you have a bad relationship with your athlete you don't have to be best friends but you know they have to trust you they have to have faith in you they have to believe that you have their back that you have their best uh, interest at heart and also that you are the person who can uh, lay out appropriate training programs uh, and, and and that you care uh, one of the one of the big things is that they they believe you care that you can raise their expectations that you can get a little bit more out of them than they think you can convince them that they are they can be better obviously without absolutely bullshitting or or, or lying to people but yeah that you can be a positive motivational influence i think and that you can, uh, sorry, I was just going to finish, and that you can create an atmosphere, an environment within which your athletes are embedded, where they feel at the center of that, that you are somebody who puts the athlete's best interests at heart, that you understand what works for them, uh, and that you value what they think, and they feel comfortable at feeding back into the program. Yeah, I think there's so much more that we we could discuss, but we we should start to to wrap it up here. But this all really comes back to like having having that structure, but uh, with flexibility, I guess, is uh, uh, the way that uh, my mind starts to process these things that you're talking about now, and and also having the awareness of how much these intangible factors that are not the the physiological training load but but things like the buy-in of the athlete into the program how much of an impact they can have and and of course as as we know and that's that's something that we talked about a lot in the past on the show as well stress from outside training does affect your training and your training adaptations but well let me um let me summarize it really quickly Uh, we started off talking about periodization Nobody knows the right structure. Design the structure that is right for your context rather than accepting these passed down rules. Because I would suggest what you design for your specific context will be better. The other thing is, in a sense, once you manage the change in training intensities and volumes carefully, 
perhaps the structure isn't necessarily that important. And I think the key thing here is there's a trade-off. There's a complex negotiation between structure and and agility that there's mechanisms built into your process with the athlete that you can adapt training and say, you know what, because of X, Y, and Z, we're going to adapt what we do today. And the, the more tightly you can have those communication links built with your athlete, the more accurate your training will be. So that's one thing. That's on planning. Second thing on stress, any coach now that is planning purely on the basis of these are your volumes, these are your intensities, without factoring in where am I going to uh, have a session where I talk to the athlete and communicate with the athlete? When am I periodically going to check in with the athlete to make sure that, hey, everything going okay? Uh, how, how If you don't build those things in, then I don't think you're planning effectively. I think I see this in my own coaching that a lot of people, uh, they ask me about coaching and they ask a lot of things about like coaching philosophy and planning and things like that. And, and people, people get into, get, they get a coach for getting a structured program that they, they think will help them become faster. They want more effective training. But what they really stay for in the end and fi- find the most value from is that uh, interaction that, uh, at least from my part, we, we have on a daily basis or every single training session. Basically, there is a, a feedback loop from the athlete and then, then from my side. And, and so I'm totally on board with you on, on that, how important that interaction and communication is. But And I think any athlete that has been coached, they realize that as well. But perhaps for self-coached athletes, it's not very clear how, how important that is. But thank you for that summary, by the way. It was brilliant. And, and I think that, that really sums up everything that we've been talking about. So is there anything else to add or should we move on to the rapid fire questions? Uh, well, you know, we could talk about it all day, but uh, yeah. So I, let's I, move on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, and these ones are really rapid fire. So one sentence or less, I will hold you to it. And the first question is, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to your field of expertise, sports science, uh, anything uh, even remotely related to what we've been talking about today? Uh, One sentence, uh, I would say the Brain Science Podcast, uh, which is a neuroscience podcast, interviews uh, researchers in neuroscience. But for me, it has been really good to understand issues around stress, issues around uh, motor coordination and so on. So even though it's um, focused on medical practitioners, I found it the most useful podcast. Yeah, I'm going to check that out myself. What's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Uh, I think that I am not particularly talented in any particular area, but I'm I think I am stubborn and I can just stay with a problem uh, for a long time. And what do you wish you had known or wish you had done differently at some point in your career? Oh, God. (laughs) I wish I'd done everything differently and I wish I'd known what I know now. But yeah, let me see. That's a tough question. Um, Some people answer that uh, everything that they've done, even when when it's wrong, that's led them to where they are. So they wouldn't change anything. So that's as good an answer as any. You know what? Yeah, no, I I wouldn't say that because um, I have done things that were. Yeah, you know, there was a period of maybe four or five years when I didn't work as hard as I could. Okay, good. Yeah. So, um, John, people can find you on uh, Twitter at Simply Sports I, and I also link to your ResearchGate profile, and that's where they can find your your papers and uh, the ones that are most relevant for what we've talked about today are called periodization paradigms in the 21st century evidence-led or tradition-driven and then we have periodization theory confronting an inconvenient truth all of that will be linked to in the show notes is there anything else that uh, you want to mention any other outlet where people can follow you no uh, that's about it i i guess um i i understand we kind of we went all around the shop, so I, I hope there was a coherent message from the the conversation. And if people want to drop me a line, um, I'll be on Twitter or, yeah. And if people have questions or comments or criticisms, I'm always happy to take them. 
Brilliant. Uh, we'll, uh, it might be one of those episodes that uh, people need to listen to twice. Uh, I think I will at least. Uh, but uh, it, at the same time, like even from the first, from having this interview, I got a ton of insights and it's uh, been one of the most interesting discussions that I had in a, in a long time. So I really want to thank you. Thank you for it. And thank you for uh, coming along for the third, uh, the third recording of this interview. So it's uh, great to finally have, have the audio, I, I believe. To put well, this look, out there for uh, people. It was my pleasure, uh, and I hope all the effort was worthwhile. Thank you. Okay, I hope that you enjoyed that interview. It was uh, very thought provoking and uh, and made made you think. I hope at least it made me think. So some of the key takeaways for me is really the difference here between planning and the structure and periodization. We are not saying that you should not have a plan, of course. We are not saying that you shouldn't have a structure to how you train. We are not even saying that you shouldn't have like a specific uh, pathway laid out for you for how you want to progress your uh, training over the long term. But the question here really is about the specific patterns of periodization like for example the classic traditional linear periodization of doing first high volume then slowly adding more intensity and and then decreasing volume as as you add more and more intensity and that way building building fitness for endurance sports that's one of the patterns of periodization and there are a few others that john mentioned but uh, but the thing is that these patterns are they are tools that you can use but there is nothing proving that those specific pathways are any better than than anything else that you might do you might come up with your complete your pattern of training of structured planned training that has little to do with any of the pre-existing periodization patterns and it might be just as effective or more effective so that really is my main takeaway from this episode that there's a difference between having a plan and having structured your training but also having variation as we talked about and having following a specific periodization pattern and there isn't really any reason to be bound to those traditional uh, historically strong periodization patterns from what we know today. Of course, as usual, you can find the show notes for this episode on thattriathlonshow.com. If you have questions or comments, leave them uh, there, and it will be linked to in the episode description. Also, if you want to get uh, another perspective on periodization, be sure to listen into episode 112, which was uh, my interview with uh, Chris Myers called Triathlon Periodization with Chris Myers. So uh, that's uh, another perspective on this, and I'm sure that that will be useful for you to listen to right after this one to to get get a slightly different uh, view point of view of things in the next episode i will interview david tilbury davis he is making a repeat appearance on the podcast about race planning and i am very much looking forward to it as i record this i'm having the interview tomorrow and i think it will be brilliant a final piece of news and information uh, there's uh, one question I think that I received more than any other in the last year or so, and that is when I will make available the triathlon specific strength training program that I talked about in, for example, episode 81, the triathlete's strength training formula, and also on my recent epic blog post. Not so recent, maybe it's all already three or four months by this time, but. Anyway, it's called uh, the uh, Triathlon Strength Training in 2018, the definitive guide. I got a lot of great feedback. Uh, But I haven't made uh, my program available yet because I've been going through a couple of major iterations and uh, countless, countless minor tweaks. But now I finally feel that it's ready to be made available. So I have published it on Training Peaks. It will be available as PDF versions later, within a month or so, I think. But uh, and if you purchase the program on Training Peaks, you will also get those PDF versions for no extra cost as soon as they're ready. Uh, and by the way, you can use this program with just a free Training Peaks account, no need to have a paid account. But uh, anyway, when I first launched this program on September 12th, I announced a launch promo of 60% off until Sunday the 23rd for followers and subscribers and listeners. But then I realized that I had actually uh, already recorded the only Monday 
podcast episode that will be released before that, December, uh, September 23rd. And uh, so that was uh, a bit of a bummer for those that are mainly listening to the podcast and not uh, following on Facebook or email. So I decided to extend that period to Sunday the 30th of September so that you have uh, a bit less than one week, six days, to get 60% off that uh, program with the discount code LAUNCH and all caps. It's all in the show notes and the episode description. You can get the link to the the Training Peaks page, and uh, that's also where you find more information about the program. You will see some sample workouts, quite a few sample workouts, so you can get a feel for what it's like and if it will be effective for you. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, click through that link in the episode description, and if you have any questions, you can always email me and uh, and ask. Big thanks to our sponsors. First, we have Roka, that is the major brand in triathlon apparel. If you're in the market for a tri suit, a swim skin, wetsuit, uh, sunglasses, goggles, anything like that, go to roka.com. That's R O K A.com. Check out their uh, apparel that they have there. I'm a big user. I have tons of Roka equipment and I love it all. It's seriously next level. You can get your order, your entire order, for 20% off with the promo code that Triathlon Show, all one word, all caps. And big thanks to Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Take their free online sweat test to get a personalized hydration strategy for your next race based on your sweat rate and sweat sodium content and your race distance as well. And uh, if you are a new Precision Hydration user, you can get your first box for free with the promo code that Triathlon Show, all one word, all caps, on precisionhydration.com. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon. <laughs>